This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Richard the Second by William Shakespeare. Act One. Scene One. London, a room in the palace. Enter King Richard, attended. John of Gaunt, with other nobles. Old John of Gaunt, time-honoured Lancaster. Hast thou, according to thy oath and band, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal, which then our leisure would not let us hear, against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appeal the Duke on ancient malice, or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence. Face to face, and frowning brow to brow, Ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. High stomached are they both, and full of ire, In rage, deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. Re-enter attendants with Bolingbroke and Mowbray. Many years of happy days befall my gracious sovereign, My most loving liege. Each day still better others' happiness until the heavens Envying earth's good hap, add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both, yet one but flatters us, as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely, to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, heaven be the record to my speech. In the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee, and mark my greeting well, for what I speak my body shall make a good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live. Since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seem the clouds that in it fly. Once more, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat. And wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, what my tongue speaks, my right-drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal, Tis not the trial of a woman's war. The bitter clamour of two eager tongues Can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast As to be hushed and not at all to say? First, the fair reverence of your highness Curbs me from giving reins and spurs To my free speech which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat setting aside his high blood's royalty and let him be no kinsman to my liege i do defy him and i spit at him and call him a slanderous coward and a villain which to maintain i would allow him odds and meet him were i tied to run afoot even to the frozen ridges of the alps or any other ground inhabitable, wherever Englishman durst set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty. By all my hopes, most falsely doth he lie. Pale trembling coward, there I throw my gage, disclaiming here the kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear, not reverence, makes thee to accept if guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honour's pawn then stoop by that and all the rights of knighthood else will i make good against thee 
arm to arm, when I have spoke, or thou canst worst devise. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, which gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree, or chivalrous design of knightly trial, and when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor, or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as of a thought of ill in him. Look, what I speak, my life shall prove it true, that Mowbray hath received eight thousand nobles in the name of lendings for your highness's soldiers, the which he hath detained for lewd employments, like a false traitor and injurious villain. Besides, I say and will in battle prove, or here, or elsewhere to the farthest verge that ever was surveyed by English eye, that all the treasons for these eighteen years, complotted and contrived in this land, fetch from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain, upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death. Suggest his soon believing adversaries, and consequently, like a traitor coward, slewest out his innocent soul through streams of blood, which blood, like sacrificing evils, cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth to me for justice and rough chastisement. And by the glorious worth of my descent, this arm shall do it or this life be spent. How high a pitch his resolution soars! Thomas of Norfolk, what sayest thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face, and bid his ears a little while be deaf, till I have told this slander of his blood, how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son, now by my sceptre's oar I make a vow, such neighbour nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialise the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray, so art thou, free speech and fearless, I to thee allow. Then Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart, through the false passage of thy throat thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Calais, dispersed I duly to his highness's soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt, upon remainder of a dear account, since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now swallow down that lie! For Gloucester's death I slew him not, but to my own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honourable father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament I did confess it, and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancour of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend, and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot, to prove myself a loyal gentleman even in the blessed blood chambered in his bosom. In haste whereof most heartily I pray your highness to assign our trial day. Wrath kindled, gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This we prescribe, though no physician. Deep malice makes too deep incision. Forget, forgive, conclude, and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it begun. We'll calm the Duke of Norfolk, you, your son. To be a make-peace shall become my age, 
throw down my son the duke of norfolk's gage and norfolk throw down his when harry when obedience bids i should not bid again norfolk throw down we bid there is no boot myself i throw dread sovereign at thy foot my life thou shalt command but not my shame the one my duty owes but my fair name despite of death that lives upon my grave to dark dishonour's use thou shalt not have i am disgraced impeached and baffled here pierced to the soul with slander's venom spear the which no balm can cure but his heart-blood which breathe this poison rage must be withstood give me his gauge lions make leopards tame yea but not change his spots take but my shame and i resign my gauge my dear dear lord the purest treasure mortal times afford in spotless reputation that away men are but gilded loam or painted clay a jewel in a ten times barred up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast mine honour is my life both grow in one take honour from me and my life is done then dear my liege mine honour let me try in that i live and for that will i die cousin throw down your gauge do you begin oh god defend my soul from such deep sin shall i seem crestfallen in my father's sight or with pale beggar fear impeach my height before this outdarred bastard ere my tongue shall wound my honour with such feeble wrong or sound so base a pearl my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear and spit it bleeding in this high disgrace where shame doth harbour even in mowbray's face exit gaunt we were not born to sue but to command which since we cannot do to make you friends be ready as your lives shall answer it at coventry upon st lambert's day there shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate since we cannot atone you we shall see justice design the victor's chivalry lord marshal command their officers at arms be ready to direct these home alarms Exeunt. End of Act One, Scene One. Act One, Scene Two. The same. A room in the Duke of Lancaster's palace. Enter Gaunt and Duchess of Gloucester. Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault, that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur, hath love in thy old blood no living fire, Edward's seven sons whereof thyself art one, were of seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by the destinies cut, but Thomas, my dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root, is cracked, and all the precious liquor spilt, is hacked down, and his summer leaves all vaded by envy's hand, and murder's bloody axe. Ah, Gaunt, his blood was thine, that bed, that womb, that metal, that self-mould that fashioned thee made him a man. And though thou livest and breathest, 
yet art thou slain in him. Thou dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, in that thou seest thy wretched brother die, who was the model of thy father's life. Call it not patience gaunt, it is despair. In suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life, teaching stern murder how to butcher thee. That which in mean men we entitle patience, is pale cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to venge my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel, for God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, has caused his death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where, then, alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defence. Why, then, I will. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry, there to behold our cousin Hereford and Fell Milbury fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's spear, that it may enter, butcher, Mowbray's breast. Or, if misfortune miss the first career, be Mowbray's sins so heavy in his bosom that they may break his foaming courser's back and throw the rider headlong in the lists, a caitiff recreant to my cousin Hereford. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thy sometimes brother's wife, with her companion, grief, must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. Yet one word more. Grief boundeth where it falls, not with the empty hollowness, but with weight. I take my leave before I have begun. For sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all. Nay, yet depart not so. Though this be all, do not so quickly go. I shall remember more. Bid him, ah, uh, what, mm, with all speed at Plashy visit me. Alack, and what shall good old York there see? But empty lodgings and unfurnished walls, unpeopled offices, untrodden stones, and what here there for welcome but my groans? Therefore commend me, let him not come there, to seek out sorrow that dwells everywhere. Desolate, desolate will I hence and die, the last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. Exeunt. End of Act One, Scene Two. Act One, Scene Three. Open space near Coventry. Lists set out and a throne. Heralds, etc., attending. Enter the Lord Marshal and O'Merle. My Lord O'Merle, is Harry Hereford armed? Yea, at all points, and longs to enter in. The Duke of Norfolk, spritefully and bold, stays but the summons of the appellant's trumpet. Why then, the champions are prepared, and stay for nothing but his majesty's approach. Enter King Richard, who takes his seat on his throne. Gaunt, Bushy, Bagot, Green, and others who take their places. A trumpet is sounded, and answered by another trumpet within. Then enter Mowbray, in armor. Defendant, preceded by a herald. Marshal, demand of yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name, and orderly proceed to swear him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the king's, say who thou art, and why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms. Against what man thou comest, and what thy quarrel? Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath. 
as so defend thee heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither come engaged by my oath, which God defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and my succeeding issue, against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my king, and me, and as I truly fight, defend me heaven. He takes his seat. Trumpet sounds. Enter Bolingbroke, appellant, in armour, preceded by a herald. Marshal, ask yonder knight in arms, both who he is, and why he cometh hither, thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and wherefore comest thou hither before King Richard in his royal lists? Against whom comest thou, and what's thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, so defend thee heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, am I, who here ready do stand in arms, to prove by God's grace and my body's valour, in lists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he's a traitor, foul and dangerous, to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the lists, except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty. For Mowbray and myself are like two men that vow a long and weary pilgrimage. Then let us take a ceremonious leave and loving farewell of our several friends. The appellant in all duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. King Richard descends from his throne. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if to-day thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me, if I be gored with Mowbray's spear, as confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you, of you, my noble cousin, Lord Amerle, not sick, although I have to do with death, but lusty, young, and the cheerly drawing breath. Lo, as at English feasts, so I regreet the daintiest last, to make the end most sweet. O oh, thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, doth with a twofold vigor lift me up to reach at victory above my head, and proof unto mine armor with thy prayers, and with thy blessings a steel my lance's point, that it may enter Mowbray's waxen coat and furbish new the name of John a gaunt, even in the lusty behavior of his son. God in thy good cause make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows, doubly redoubled, fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood, be valiant, and live. Mine innocency and St. George to thrive. He takes his seat. Mowbray, rising. However God or fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage 
and embrace his golden uncontrolled enfranchisement. More than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary. Most mighty liege, and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years. As gentle and as jocund as to jest go I to fight, truth hath a quiet breast. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valour couched in thine eye. Order the trial, Marshal, and begin. The king and the lords return to their seats. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy lance, and God defend the right. Strong as a tower in hope, I cry Amen. Go, bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself, on pain to be found false and recreant, to prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his king, and him, and dares him to step forward to the fight. Here standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, on pain to be found false and recreant, both to defend himself and to approve, Henry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, to God his sovereign and to him disloyal, courageously, and with a free desire, attending but the signal to begin. Sound trumpets, and set forward, combatants. A charge sounded. Stay, the king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears, and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us, and let the trumpets sound, while we return these dukes what we decree. Along a flourish, to the combatants. Draw near, and list what with our counsel we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds ploughed up with neighbours' swords, and for we think the eagle-winged pride of sky-aspiring and ambitious thoughts, with rival-hating envy, set on you to wake our peace, which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep, which so roused up with boisterous untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets dreadful bray, and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines fright fair peace, and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore we banish you our territories, you, cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not re-greet our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be, that sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Norfolk, for thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness's mouth. A dearer merit, not so deep a maim as to be cast forth in the common air, have I deserved at your highness's hands. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English, now I must forego, and now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up, or, being open, put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony. Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly poor coolest with my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance has made my jailer to attend on me. 
I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence, then, but speechless death which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate. After our sentence, plaining comes too late. Then thus I turn me from my country's light To dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Retiring Return again, and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God. Our part therein we banish with yourselves, To keep the oath that we administer. You never shall, so help you, truth and God, Embrace each other's love in banishment, Nor never look upon each other's face, Nor never write, regreet, nor reconcile This luring tempest of your home-bred hate, Nor never by advised purpose meet To plot, contrive, or complot any ill Against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear. And I to keep all this. Norfolk, so far as to mine enemy. By this time, had the king permitted us, one of our souls had wandered in the air, banished of this frail sepulchre of our flesh. And now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly the realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along the clogging burden of a guilty soul. No, Bolingbroke, if ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know, and all too soon, I fear, the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray. Save back to England, all the world's my way. Exit. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent, return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word. Four lagging winters, and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile, but little vantage shall I reap thereby. For ere the six years that he hath to spend Can change their moons and bring their times about, My oil-dried lamp and time-be-wasted light Shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done, And blindful death not let me see my son. Why, uncle? Thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow, And pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, But stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death. But dead, thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, Whereto thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why, at our justice, seem'st thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove in digestion sour. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child, to smooth his fault I should have been more mild, a partial slander sought I to avoid, and in the sentence my own life destroyed, alas. 
I looked when some of you should say I was too strict to make my own away. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue, against my will, to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell, and uncle, bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. Flourish. Exit King Richard and Train. Cousin, farewell. What presence must not know from where you do remain, let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. Oh, to what purpose dost thou hoard thy words that thou return'st no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my leave of you. When the tongue's office should be prodigal to breathe the abundant dolor of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Joy absent. Grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. Two men enjoy. But grief makes one hour ten. Call it a travel that thou takest for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. The sullen passage of thy weary steps esteem as foil wherein thou art to set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather, every tedious stride I make will but remember me what a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign passages, and in the end, having my freedom, boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit where it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor, and not the king exiled thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look what thy soul holds dear, imagine it, to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds, musicians, the grass whereon thou treadst the present strewed, the flowers of fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks it and sets it light. Oh, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty Caucasus, or cloy the unhungry edge of appetite by bare imagination of a feast, or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat Oh, no, the apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Fell sorrow's tooth doth never rankle more than when it bites, but lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. Then, England's ground, farewell, sweet soil, adieu, my mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, 
boast of this I can, though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. Exeunt. End of Act One, Scene Three. Act One, Scene Four, London, A Room in the King's Castle. Enter King Richard, Bagot, and Green at one door, O'Merle at another. We did observe. Cousin O'Merle, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say, what store of parting tears were shed? Faith, none for me, e except the north-east wind which then blew bitterly against our faces, awaked the, the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. What said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. And for my heart disdain that my tongue should so profane the word, that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression of such grief, that words seemed buried in my sorrow's grave. Mary, would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment? He should have had a volume of farewells, but since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. But tis doubt, when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen come to see his friends. Ourself and Bushy, Bagot here, and Green, observed his courtship to the common people, how he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy, what reverence he did throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles, and patient underbearing of his fortune, as to to banish their effects with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench, a brace of draymen, bid God speed him well, and had the tribute of his supple knee, with thanks my countrymen, my loving friends, as were our England in reversion his, and he our subject's next degree in hope. Well, he is gone, and with him go these thoughts. Now for the rebels which stand out in Ireland, Expedient vantage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness' loss. We will ourself in person to this war, and for our coffers with too great a court and liberal largesse are grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that come short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, whereto, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold, and send them after to supply our wants, for we will make for Ireland presently. Enter Bushy. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken and hath sent post-haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Where lies he? At Ely House. Now put it, God, in his physician's mind, to help him to his grave immediately. The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we may make haste, and come too late. Amen. Amen. Exeunt. End of Act One, Scene Four. End of Act One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Richard the Second by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene One. London, an apartment 
in Eli House. Gaunt on a couch, the Duke of York and others standing by him. Will the king come that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth? Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to gloss. More are men's ends marked than their lives before. The setting sun, and music at the close, As the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, Writ in remembrance more than things long past, Though Richard my life's counsel would not hear, My death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds, As praises of whose taste the wise are fond, Lascivious metres to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen, reports of fashions in proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy apish nation limps after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity? So it be new, there's no respect how vile that is not quickly buzzed into his ears. Then all too late comes counsel to be heard, where will doth mutiny with wits regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose, Tis breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, And thus expiring do foretell of him His rash fierce blaze of riot cannot last, For violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short, he tires betimes that spurs too fast betimes. With eager feeding, food doth choke the feeder. Light vanity, insatiate cormorant, consuming meals soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, Demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat, defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth. This realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their seeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre in stubborn jewelry of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm, England, bound in with the triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds, that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, would the scandal vanish with my life! How happy, then, were my ensuing death! Enter King Richard and Queen, O Merle, Bushy, Green, Bagot, Ross, and Willoughby. The king is come. Deal mildly with his youth, for young hot cults being raged do rage the more. How fares our noble uncle, Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is it with aged Gaunt? 
Oh, how that name befits my composition, old, gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt for sleeping England long time have I watched. Watching breeds leanness. Leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's looks. And therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt I am for the grave. Gaunt as a grave. Whose hollow womb inherits naught but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No, misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no, men living flatter those that die. Thou now a dying sayest thou flatterest me. Oh, no, thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health, I breathe and see thee ill. Now, he that made me knows I see thee ill, ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill, thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land wherein thou liest in reputation sick, and thou, too careless patient as thou art, commit'st the anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head. And yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons, from forth they reach he would have laid thy shame deposing thee before thou were possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England, art thou now not king? Thy state of law is bond-slave to the law, and— And thou, a lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an ague's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now, by my seat's right royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son? This tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father, Edward's son, that blood already, like a pelican, hast thou tapped and drunkenly caroused. My brother Gloucester, plain, well-meaning soul, whom fair befall in heaven mongst happy souls, may be a precedent, and witness good that thou respectest not spilling Edward's blood. Join with the present sickness that I have, and thy unkindness be like crooked age to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be convey me to my bed, and then to my grave. Love they to live that love and honour have. Exit borne out by his attendants. And let them die that age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life, and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right, you say true. As Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine. 
and all be as it is. Enter Northumberland. My liege old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument, words, life, and all old Lancaster hath spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so. Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. Now for our Irish wars. We must supplant those rough, rug-headed kerns which live like venom, where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge. Towards our assistance we do seize to us the plate, coin, revenues, and movables, whereof our uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Ah, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace, have ever made me sour my patient cheek, or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce. In peace was never gentle lamb more mild, than was that young and princely gentleman. His face thou hast, for even so looked he, accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French, and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. O Richard, York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? O oh, my liege, pardon me, if you please. If not, I please not to be pardoned, am content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banish Hereford? Is not Gaunt dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not to-morrow then ensue to-day. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now, afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in the letters patents that he hath by his attorney generals to sue his livery, and deny his offered homage, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head, you lose a thousand well-disposed hearts, and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while, my liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. Exit. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire straight. Bid him repair to us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland, and tis time, I trow. And we create in absence of ourself our uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he is just, and always loved us well. Come on, our Queen, tomorrow must we part. Be merry, for our time of stay is short. Exeunt King, Queen, Bushy, O'Merle, Green, and Bagot. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living, too, for now his son is Duke. Barely in title, not in revenues. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence, ere it be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tends that thou would speak to the Duke of Hereford? If it be so, out with it boldly, man. Quick is mine ear to hear of good towards him. No good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now afore God tis shame such wrongs are born in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers, and what they will inform merely in hate gainst any of us all, 
That will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes, and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised, as blanks, benevolences, and I wot not what. But what, O oh God's name, doth become of this? Wars hath not wasted it, for ward he hath not, but basely yielded upon compromise that which his ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars. His burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But, lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet seek no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but surely perish. We see the very rack that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our rack. Not so, even through the hollow eyes of death I spy life peering, but I dare not say how near the tidings of our comfort is. Nay, let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are but his thoughts. Therefore, be bold. Then thus, I have from Le Port Blanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, the late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir John Ramston, Sir John Norbury, Sir John Waterton, and Francis Quoit. All these well furnished by the Duke of Britain, with eight tall ships, three thousand men of war are making hither with all due expedience, and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the King for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out of our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broking pawn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our sceptre's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself. Away with me in post to Ravenspur. But if you faint as fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse! Urge doubts to them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I will first be there. Exeunt. End of Act Two, Scene One. Act Two, Scene Two. The same. A room in the castle. Enter Queen, Bushy, and Bagot. Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king I did. To please myself I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks, some unborn sorrow, ripe in fortune's womb, is coming towards me and my inward soul with nothing trembles. At something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye glazed with blinding tears divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion, eye to eye distinguish form. So, your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, find shapes of grief more than himself to wail, which, looked on as it is, is not but shadows of what it is not. Then, thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure, weep not. More is not seen. Or, if it be, it is with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. However it be, I cannot but be sad, so heavy sad as, though in thinking on no thought I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. 
"'Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady.' "'Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for nothing hath begot my something grief, or something hath the nothing that I grieve. "'Tis in reversion that I do possess, but what it is, that is not yet known, what I cannot name. "'Tis nameless woe, I wot." Enter Green. God save your majesty, and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hopest thou so? Tis better hope he is, for his designs crave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself, and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravensburg. Now God in heaven forbid. Ah, madam, tis too true. And that is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his son young Henry Percy, the lords of Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have whereupon the Earl of Worcester has broken his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So, Green, thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, a gasping new-delivered mother, have woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joined. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair, and be at enmity with cozening hope. He is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bands of life, which false hope lingers in extremity. Enter York. Here comes the Duke of York. With signs of war about his aged neck. Oh, full of careful business are his looks. Uncle, for God's sake, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I left to underprop his land, who, weak with age, cannot support myself. How comes the sick hour that his surfeit made? Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. Enter a servant. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was? Why so? Go all which way it will. The nobles they are fled, the commons they are cold, and will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. Sirrah, get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. Hold. Take my ring. My lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. To-day, as I came by, I called there. But I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is knave? An hour before I came, the Duchess died. God for his mercy, what a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God so my untruth had not provoked him to it, the King had cut off my head with my brothers. What, are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say, pray, pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armour that is there. Exit Servant Gentlemen, will you go muster men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs, thus disorderly thrust into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen. The one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. T'other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men, and meet me presently at Barclay. I should to Plashy, too, but time will not permit. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. Exeunt York and Queen The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that is the wavering commons, for their love lies in their purses, 
and whoso empties them, by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you. For little office the hateful commons will perform for us, except like curs to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No. I will to Ireland to his majesty. Farewell. If heart's presages be not vain, we three here part that ne'er shall meet again. That says York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once, for all, and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. Exeunt. End of Act Two, Scene Two. Act Two, Scene Three, The Wolds in Gloucestershire. Enter Bolingbroke in Northumberland with forces. How far is it, my lord, to Berkeley now? Believe me, noble lord, I am a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough, uneven ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me what a weary way from Ravenspur to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby wanting your company, which, I protest, hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess, and hope to joy is little less in joy than hope enjoyed. By this the weary lord shall make their way seem short, as mine hath done by sight of what I have, your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes here? Enter Harry Percy. It is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I had thought, my lord, to have learned his health of you. Why, is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What is his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, is gone to Ravensburg to offer service to the Duke of Hereford, and sent me over by Barclay to discover what power the Duke of York hath levied there then with directions to repair to Ravensburg. Have you forgotten the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that is not forgot which ne'er I did remember. To my knowledge I never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. My gracious lord, I tender you my service, such as it is, being tender, raw, and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and desert. I thank thee, gentle Percy, and be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hand thus seals it. How far is it to Berkeley, and what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle, by yon tuft of trees, manned with three hundred men, as I have heard, and in it are the lords of York, Berkeley, and Seymour, none else of name and noble estimate. Enter Ross and Willoughby. Here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords. I what your love pursues. A banished traitor, all my treasury is yet but unfelt, thanks which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. 
and far surmounts our labor to attain it. Evermore thanks the exchequer of the poor, which, till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But who comes here? Enter Berkeley. It is my lord of Berkeley, as I guess. My lord of Hereford, my message is to you. My lord, my answer is to Lancaster, and I am come to seek that name in England, and I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord. Tis not my meaning to raise one title of your honor out. To you, my lord, I come, what lord you will, from the most gracious regent of this land, the Duke of York, to know what pricks on you, to take advantage of the absent time, and fright your native peace with self-born arms. Enter York, attended. I shall not need to transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. My noble uncle. Kneels. Show me thy humble heart and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Tut, tut, grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more why, why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom? Frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms. Comest thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I but now lord of such hot youth as when brave Gaunt, thy father, and myself, rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men, from forth the ranks of many thousand French, oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault? My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stand it, and wherein? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. And, noble uncle, I beseech your grace, Look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for methinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh, then, my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond, my rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce, and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king in England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, a Merle, my noble cousin. Had you first died, and he been thus trodden down, he should have found his uncle Gaunt a father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, and yet my letters Parents give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all amiss employed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and challenge law? Attorneys are denied me, and therefore personally I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. It stands your grace upon to do him right. Base men by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feelings of my cousin's wrongs, and laboured all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver, and cut out his way to find out right with wrong, it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion, and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own, and for the right of that we all have strongly sworn to give him aid, 
And let him never see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all, and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known unto you, I do remain as neuter. So fare ye well, unless you please to enter in the castle, and there repose you for this night. An offer, uncle, that we will accept. But we must win your grace to go with us. To Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Bagot, and their complices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. Exeunt. End of Act Two, Scene Three. Act Two, Scene Four. A Camp in Wales. Enter Earl of Salisbury and a Captain. My Lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the King. Therefore we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fright the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloodily upon the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and leap. The one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, as well assured Richard their king is dead. Exit. Ah, Richard, with the eyes of heavy mind, I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woe and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. Exit. End of Act Two, Scene Four, and End of Act Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Richard the Second by William Shakespeare. Act Three, Scene One Bristol, Bolingbroke's Camp. Enter Bolingbroke, York, Northumberland, Henry Percy, Willoughby, Ross, Officers behind with Bushy and Green, Prisoners. Bring forth these men. Bushy and green, I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies, with too much urging your pernicious lives, for tour no charity, yet to wash your blood from off my hands, here, in the view of men, I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman, in blood and liniments, by you, unhappied and disfigured clean, you have in manner with your sinful hours made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed, and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks, with tears drawn from our eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries, and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment, whilst you have fed upon my signories, 
This parked my parks and felled my forest woods. From my own windows torn down, my household coat raised out my impress, leaving me no sign save men's opinions and my living blood to show the world I am a gentleman. This and much more, much more than twice all this, condemns you to the death. See them delivered over to execution and the hand of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lord, farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord, Northumberland, see them dispatched. Exeunt Northumberland and others with Bushy and Green. Uncle, you say the queen is at your house. For God's sake, fairly let her be entreated. Tell her I sent to her my kind commends. Take special care my greetings be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched with letters of your love to her at large. Thanks, gentle uncle. Come, lords, away, to fight with Glendower and his complices, a while to work, and after holiday. Exeunt. End of Act 3, Scene 1. Act 3, Scene 2. The Coast of Wales. A Castle in View. Flourish, drums and trumpets. Enter King Richard, the Bishop of Carlisle, O'Merle, and soldiers. Barclay Castle, do they call this at hand? Yea, my lord. How brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Needs must I like it well. I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand. The rebels wound thee with their horses' hoofs, as a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears, and smiles in meeting. So, weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favours with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense. But let thy spiders suck up thy venom, And heavy-gated toads lie in their way, Doing annoyance to the treacherous feet Which with usurping steps do trample thee. Yield stinging nettles to mine enemies, And when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, Guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder, Whose double tongue may with a mortal touch Throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Mock not my senseless conjuration, lords. This earth shall have a feeling, And these stones prove armed soldiers, Ere her native king shall falter Under foul rebellion's arms. Fear not, my lord, that power that made you king Hath power to keep you king in spite of all. The means that heaven yields must be embraced And not neglected. Else if heaven would, and we will not, heaven's offer we refuse, the proffered means of succour and redress. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss, whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in friends. Discomfortable cousin, knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage boldly here. But when, from under this terrestrial ball, he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines, and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor, Bolingbroke, who all this while hath revelled in the night whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne in the east, his treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough, rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. 
for every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then, if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. Enter Salisbury. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue, and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. O oh, call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day, too late, o'erthrows thy joys, friends, fortune, and thy state. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege, why looks your grace so pale? But now the blood of twenty thousand men did triumph in my face, and they are fled, and till so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side, for time hath set a blot upon my pride. Comfort, my liege, remember who you are. I had forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepest. Is not the king's name twenty thousand names? Arm, arm, my name. A puny subject strikes at thy great glory. Look not to the ground, ye favourites of a king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? Enter Sir Stephen Scroop. More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care tuned tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, say, is my kingdom lost? Why, twas my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be as great as we? Greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too. And be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects? That we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin, loss, decay. The worst is death, and death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. Like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores, as if the world were all dissolved to tears, so high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard bright steel and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty, and boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff unwieldy arms against thy crown. Thy very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal yew against thy state. Yea, distaff women manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both young and old rebel, and all goes worse than I have power to tell. Too well, too well thou tellest a tale so ill. Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What is become of Bushy? Where is Green? that they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such 
peaceful steps. If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they have made peace with Bolingbroke. Peace have they made with him indeed, my lord. O oh, villains, vipers, damned without redemption, dogs easily won to fawn on any man, snakes in my heart-blood warmed that sting my heart, three Judases, each one thrice worse than Judas, would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offence. Sweet love, I see, changing his property, turns to the sourest and most deadly hate. Again uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads, not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound, and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy green? And the Earl of Wiltshire dead? I, all of them, at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke my father with his power? No matter where. Of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors, and talk of wills. And yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all are Bolingbrooks, And nothing can we call our own but death, And that small model of the barren earth Which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground And tell sad stories of the death of kings how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared, and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humoured thus comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. And farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? Lord, wise men ne'er sit and wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail. To fear the foe, since fear oppresseth strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe, and so your follies fight against yourself. Fear and be slain. No worse can come to fight, and fight and die is death destroying death, where fearing dying pays death's servile breath. My father hath power. Inquire of him, and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidst me well. Proud Bolingbroke, I come to change blows with thee for our day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown, an easy task it is to win our own. Say, Scroop, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state in inclination of the day. So may you, by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer, by small and small, 
to lengthen out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Thou hast said enough. To O'Merle. Beshrew thee, cousin, which didst lead me forth of that sweet way I was in to despair. What sayst you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away. A king, woe's slave, shall kingly woe obey. That power I have discharge. And let them go to ear the land that hath some hope to grow. For I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this. For counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He doth me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away from Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. Exeunt. End of Act Three, Scene Two. Act Three, Scene Three. Wales. Before Flint Castle. Enter with drum and colours, Bolingbroke and forces, York, Northumberland, and others. So that by this intelligence we learn, the Welshmen are dispersed, and Salisbury is gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard not far from hence hath hid his head. It would beseem Lord Northumberland to say King Richard. Alack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes. Only to be brief left I his title out. The time hath been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you, for taking so the head your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens are over our heads. I know it, uncle, but oppose not myself against their will. But who comes here? Enter Henry Percy. Welcome, Henry. What will not this castle yield? The castle royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why, it contains no king? Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lime and stone, and with him are the Lord Almerle, uh, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a clergyman of holy reverence who I cannot learn. Oh, belike it is the Bishop of Carlisle. To Northumberland. Noble lord, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle. Through brazen trumpet send the breath of parley to his ruined ears, and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke on both his knees doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come even at his feet to lay my arms and power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power, and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood, rained from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. The which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempest should be drench the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land. My stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go, signify as much. While here we march upon the grassy carpet of this plain, let's march without the noise of threatening drum, that from this castle's tottered battlements our fair appointments may well be pursued. 
methinks King Richard and myself should meet, with no less terror than the elements of fire and water, when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his, whilst on earth I rain my waters, on the earth and not on him. March on, and mark King Richard how he looks. A parley sounded, and answered by a trumpet within. Flourish. Enter on the walls the king, the bishop of Carlisle, O'Merrill, Scroop, and Salisbury. See, see, King Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. Yet he looks like a king. Behold, his eye as bright as is the eagle's lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack, alack for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. To Northumberland We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourself thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our sceptre, unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet know my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vassal hands against my head, and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bolingbroke, for yond methinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He is come to open the purple testament of bleeding war. But ere the crown he looks for live in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face, change the complexion of her made pale peace to scarlet indignation, and bedew her pasture's grass with faithful English blood. The King of Heaven forbid our Lord the King should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand, and by the honourable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honour of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince, is just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, say, thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing mind, Commends. Northumberland retires to Bolingbroke. To O'Merrill. We do abase ourselves, cousin, do we not? To look so poorly, and to speak so fair? Shall we call back Northumberland, and send defiance to the traitor, and so die? No, good my lord, let's fight with gentle words, Till time lend friends, and friends their helpful swords. 
Oh, God, oh, God! That ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth. Oh, that I was as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name, or that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swellest thou, proud heart? I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? For God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an almsman's gown, my figured goblet for a dish of wood, my sceptre for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave. A little, little grave, an obscure grave, or I'll be buried in the king's highway. Some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head. For on my heart they tread now whilst I live. And buried once, why not upon my head? O Mel, thou weepest, my tender-hearted cousin. We'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes and make some pretty match with shedding tears? As thus, to drop them still upon one place till they have fretted us a pair of graves within the earth. And there, inlaid, there lies two kinsmen digged their graves with weeping eyes. Would not this ill do well? Well, well, I see I talk but idly, and you laugh at me. Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, and Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth contend to speak with you. May it please you to come down? Down, down I come, like glistering phyton, wanting the manage of unruly jades. In the base court? Base court, where kings grow base, to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. In the base court, come down, down court, down king, for night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. Exeunt from above. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart makes him speak fondly like a frantic man, yet he is come. Enter King Richard and his attendants. Stand all apart, and show fair duty to his majesty. Kneeling. My gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, thus high at least, although your knee be low. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well you deserve, 
they well deserve to have, that know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hand. Nay, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to. For do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London. Cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. Flourish. Exeunt. End of Act Three, Scene Three. Act Three, Scene Four. Langley, the Duke of York's Garden. Enter the Queen and two ladies. What sport shall we devise here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care? Madame, we'll play at balls. So make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune runs against the bias. Madame, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight, when my poor heart no measure keeps in grief. Therefore no dancing girl. Some other sport. Madame, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy. Of either, madame. Of neither, girl. For if of joy, being altogether wanting, it doth remember me the more of sorrow, or if of grief, being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. For what I have I need not to repeat, and what I want it boots not to complain. Madame, I'll sing. Tis well that thou hast cause, but thou shouldst please me better wouldst thou weep. I could weep, madame, would it do you good? And I could sing would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee. But stay, here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees. My wretchedness unto a row of pins. They will talk of state, for every one doth so against a change. Woe is forerun with woe. Queen and ladies retire. Enter a gardener and two servants. Go bind thou up yon dangling apricocks, which, like unruly children, make their sire stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and, like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. You thus employed, I will go root away the noisome weeds, which, without profit, suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we, in the compass of a pale, keep law, and form, and due proportion, showing, as in a model, our firm estate, when our sea-walled garden, the whole land, is full of weeds, her fairest flowers choked up, her fruit-trees unpruned, her hedges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. Hold thy peace. He that hath suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The weeds, which his broad-spreading leaves did shelter, that seemed in eating him to hold him up, are plucked up, root and all, by Bolingbroke, I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, bushy, green. What? Are they dead? They are, and Bolingbroke hath seized the wasteful king. Oh, what pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden? We, at time of year, do wound the bark, the skin of our fruit-trees, lest, being over-proud in sap and blood, with too much riches it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear, and he to taste their fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away, that bearing boughs may live. Had he done so, himself had home the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What? Think you the king shall be deposed? 
Depressed he is already, and deposed tis doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell black tidings. Oh, I am pressed to death through want of speaking. Coming forward. Thou, old Adam's likeness, set to dress this garden. How dares thy harsh rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? What Eve, what serpent hath suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Darest thou, though little better thing than earth, divine his downfall? Say where, when, and how camest thou by this ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch! Pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe this news, yet what I say is true. King Richard, he is in the mighty hold of Bolingbroke. Their fortunes both are weighed. In your lord's scale is nothing but himself, and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbroke, besides himself, are all the English peers. And with that odds he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London, and you will find it so. I speak no more than every one doth know. Nimble mischance that art so light of foot, doth not thy embassage belong to me, and am I last that knows it? O oh, thou thinkest to serve me last, that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. Come, ladies, go, to meet at London, London's king in woe. What was I born to this, that my sad look should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke? Gardner, for telling me these news of woe, Pray God the plants thou grafts may never grow. Exeunt Queen and Ladies Poor Queen, so that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill were subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear, here in this place I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue, even for Ruth, here shortly shall be seen, in the remembrance of a weeping queen. Exeunt. End of Act 3, Scene 4, and End of Act 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE TRAGEDY OF KING RICHARD THE SECOND BY WILLIAM SHAKESPEARE ACT FOUR SCENE ONE WESTMINSTER HALL THE LORD'S SPIRITUAL ON THE RIGHT SIDE OF THE THRONE THE LORD'S TEMPORAL ON THE LEFT THE COMMONS BELOW ENTER BOLINGBROKE, O'MURL, SURREY, NORTHUMBERLAND, HENRY PERCY, FITZWATER, ANOTHER LORD, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, and attendants. Officers behind, with Bagot. Call forth Bagot. Now, Bagot, freely speak thy mind. What thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death, who wrought it with the king, and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end? Then set before my face the Lord or Merle. Cousin, stand forth and look upon that man. My Lord or Merle, I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what once it hath delivered. In that dead time when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, Is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Calais, to mine uncle's head. Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say that you had rather refuse the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England, adding withal how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. Princes and noble lords, what answer shall I give to this base man? Shall I so much dishonor my fair stars on equal terms to give him chastisement? 
either i must or have mine honour soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips there is my gauge the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell i say thou liest and will maintain what thou hast said is false in thy heart blood through being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword Bagot, forbear thou shalt not take it up excepting one i would he were the best in all this presence that hath moved me so if that thy valour stand on sympathies there is my gage amel engaged to thine be that fair sign which shows me where thou standst i heard thee say and vauntingly thou spakest it that thou wert cause of noble gloucester's death if thou deniest it twenty times thou liest and i will turn thy falsehood to thy heart where it was forged with my rapier's point thou darest not coward live to see that day now by my soul i would it were this hour fitzwater thou art damned to hell for this Omer, thou liest. His honour is as true in this appeal as thou art an unjust. And that thou art so, there I throw my gage, to prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it if thou darest. And if I do not, may my hands rot off, and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. I task the earth to the like forsworn Almerl, and spur thee on with as many lies as may be hallowed in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun there is my honour's pawn engage it to the trial if thou darest who sets me else by heaven i'll throw it all i have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you my lord fitzwater i do remember well the very time o merle and you did talk tis very true you were in presence then and you can witness with me this is true as false by heaven as heaven itself is true surrey thou liest dishonourable boy that lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render vengeance and revenge till thou the lie-giver and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull in proof whereof there is my honour's pawn engage it to the trial if thou darest how fondly dost thou spur a forward horse if i dare eat or drink or breathe or live i dare meet surrey in a wilderness and spit upon him whilst i say he lies and lies and lies there is my bond of faith to tie thee to my strong correction as i intend to thrive in this world a uh, merrill is guilty of my true appeal besides i heard the banished norfolk say that thou Amerl, didst send two of thy men to execute the noble duke at calais some honest christian trust me with a gage that norfolk dies here do i throw down this if he me be repealed to try his honour these differences shall all rest under gage till norfolk be repealed repealed he shall be and though mine enemy restored again to all his land and signories when he is returned against a merle we will enforce his trial that honourable day shall ne'er be seen many a time hath banished norfolk fought for jesu christ in glorious christian field streaming the ensign of the christian cross against black pagans turks and saracens and toiled with works of war retired himself to italy and there at venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth and his pure soul unto his captain christ 
under whose colours he had fought so long. Why, Bishop? Is Norfolk dead? As surely as I live, my lord. Sweet peace, conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Lords, appellants, your differences shall all rest under gauge till we assign you to your days of trial. Enter York, attended. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his high sceptre yield to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. In God's name I'll ascend the royal throne. Mary. God forbid! Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard, then true noblesse would learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them, and shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy-elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, for fend it, God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous, black, seen a deed i speak to subjects and a subject speaks stirred up by god thus boldly for his king my lord of hereford here whom you call king is a foul traitor to proud hereford's king and if you crown him let me prophesy the blood of english shall manure the ground and future ages groan for this foul act peace shall go sleep with turks and infidels and in this seat of peace tumultuous war shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound disorder horror fear and mutiny shall here inhabit and this land be called the field of golgotha and dead men's skulls Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it. Resist it. Let it not be so, lest child, child's children cry against you, woe! Well have you argued, sir, and... For your pains of capital treason we arrest you here. My lord Westminster, be at your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, lords, to grant the common suit. Fetch hither, Richard, that in common view he may surrender. So we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. Exit. Lords, you that here are under our arrest. Procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hands. Re-enter York with King Richard and officers, bearing the crown, etc. Alack, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned? I hardly yet have learnt to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee. Give sorrow, leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I well remember the favours of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry, All hail! to me? So Judas did to Christ, but he, in twelve, found truth in all but one. I, in twelve thousand, none. God save the king, will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? 
Well, then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he, and yet, amen, if heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer. The resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. Here, cousin, on this side my hand, and on that side thine. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets, filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen, and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs, while you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs, still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care, by old care done. Your care is gain of care, by new care won. The cares I give I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no, no, I, for I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head, and this unwieldy sceptre from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my balm. With mine own hands I give away my crown. With mine own tongue deny my sacred state. With mine own breath release all duteous rites. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees, and statutes. I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that are made to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleased that hath all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Henry, unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more, but that you read these accusations, and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land, that by confessing them the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Must I do so? And must I ravel out my weaved-up follies? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon me whilst that my wretchedness doth bait myself, though some of you with Pilate wash your hands, showing an outward pity, yet you pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch! Read all these articles! 
mine eyes are full of tears i cannot see and yet salt water blinds them not so much but that they can see a sort of traitors here nay if i turn mine eyes upon myself i find myself the traitor with the rest for i have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king made glory base and sovereignty a slave proud majesty a subject state a peasant my lord no lord of thine thou haught insulting man nor no man's lord i have no name no title no not that name was given me at the font but tis usurped alack the heavy day that i have worn so many winters out and know not now what name to call myself oh that i were a mockery king of snow standing before the sun of bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops good king great king and yet not greatly good and if my word be sterling yet in england let it command a mirror hither straight that it may show me what a face i am since it is bankrupt of his majesty go some of you and fetch a looking-glass exit an attendant read o'er this paper while the glass doth come fiend thou torment'st me ere i come to hell urge it no more my lord northumberland the commons will not then be satisfied they shall be satisfied i'll read enough when i do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ and that's myself re-enter attendant with glass give me that glass and therein will i read no deeper wrinkles yet hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wounds o oh, flattering glass like to my followers in prosperity thou dost beguile me was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep ten thousand men was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink is this the face which faced so many follies that was at last outfaced by bolingbroke a brittle glory shineth in this face as brittle as the glory is the face dashes the glass against the ground for there it is cracked in a hundred shivers mark silent king the moral of this sport how soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face the shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face say that again the shadow of my sorrow ha let's see tis very true my grief lies all within and these external manner of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul there lies the substance and i thank thee king for thy great bounty that not only givest me cause to wail but teachest me the way how to lament the cause i'll beg one boon and then be gone and trouble you no more shall i obtain it name it fair cousin fair cousin i am greater than a king for when i was a king my flatterers were then but subjects being now a subject i have a king here to my flatterer being so great i have no need to beg yet ask and shall i have you shall then give me leave to go whither whither you will so i were from your sight go some of you convey him to the tower oh good convey conveyors are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall exeunt king richard and guard on wednesday next we solemnly set down our coronation 
lords, prepare yourselves. Exeunt all but the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, and O'Merle. A woeful pageant have we here beheld. The woes to come. The children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? My lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow, and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper. I will lay, our plot shall show us all a merry day. Exeunt. End of Act 4, Scene 1, and End of Act 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Richard the Second by William Shakespeare. Act V. Scene One. London. A street leading to the tower. Enter the Queen and ladies. This way the King will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill-erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by proud Bolingbroke. Here let us rest, if this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. Enter King Richard and guard. But soft, but see, or rather do not see, my fair rose wither. Yet look up, behold, that you in pity may dissolve to dew, and wash him fresh again with true love tears. Ah, thou the model where old Troy did stand, thou map of honour, thou King Richard's tomb and not King Richard, thou most beauteous inn, why should hard-favoured grief be lodged in thee when triumph is become an alehouse guest? Join not with grief, fair woman, do not so, to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream, from which awake the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn brother, sweet, to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Hie thee to France, and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here have thrown down. What? Is my Richard both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke disposed thine intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying thrusteth forth his paw, And wounds the earth if nothing else, With rage to be o'erpowered. And wilt thou, pupil-like, Take the correction mildly, Kiss the rod and fawn on rage with base humility, Which art a lion and the king of beasts? A king of beasts, indeed, If aught but beasts. I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometimes, queen, prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest, as from my deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious nights sit by the fire with good old folks, and let them tell thee tale of woeful ages long ago betide. And ere thou bid good night, to quit their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me, and send the hearers weeping to their bed. For why, the senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue, and in compassion weep the fire out. And some will mourn in ashes, some coal black, for the deposing of a rightful king. Enter Northumberland, attended. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You must to Pomfret, not unto the tower. And, madam, there is an order ta'en for you. With all swift speed, you must away to France. Northumberland, 
thou ladder wherewithal the mounting bolingbrook ascends my throne the time shall not be many hours of age more than it is ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption thou shalt think though he divide the realm and give thee half it is too little helping him to all and he shall think that thou which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings will know again being ne'er so little urged another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne the love of wicked men converts to fear that fear to hate and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death my guilt be on my head and there at an end take leave and part for you must part forthwith doubly divorced bad men ye violate a twofold marriage twixt my crown and me and then betwixt me and my married wife let me unkiss the oath betwixt thee and me and yet not so for with a kiss twas made part us northumberland i towards the north where shivering cold and sickness pines the clime my wife to france from whence set forth in pomp she came adorned hither like sweet may sent back like hallowmas or shortest of day and must we be divided must we part ay hand from hand my love and heart from heart banish us both and send the king with me that were some love but little policy then whither he goes thither let me go so two together weeping make one woe weep thou for me in france i for thee here better far off than near be near the near go count thy way with sighs i mine with groans so long as we shall have the longest moans twice for one step i'll groan the way being short and piece the way out with a heavy heart come come in wooing sorrow let's be brief since wedding it there is such length in grief one kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part thus give i mine and thus take i thy heart they kiss give me mine own again twere no good part to take on me to keep and kill thy heart they kiss again so now i have mine own again be gone that i may strive to kill it with a groan we make woe wanton with this fond delay once more adieu the rest let sorrow say exeunt end of act five scene one act five scene two the same a room in the duke of york's palace enter york and his duchess my lord you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into london where did i leave at that sad stop my lord where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on king richard's head then as i said the great duke bolingbroke mounted upon a hot and fiery steed which his aspiring rider seemed to know with slow but stately pace kept on his course while all tongues cried god save thee bolingbroke you would have thought the very windows spake so many greedy looks of young and old through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visage and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once jesu preserve thee welcome bolingbroke whilst he from the one side to the other turning bareheaded lower than his proud steed's neck bespake them thus i thank you countrymen and thus still doing thus he passed along alack poor richard where rode he the whilst as in a theatre the eyes of men after a well-graced actor leaves the stage are idly bent on him that enters next thinking his prattle to be tedious even so or with much more contempt men's eyes did scowl on gentle richard no man cried god save him 
no joyful tongue gave him his welcome home but dust was thrown upon his sacred head which with such gentle sorrow he shook off his face still combating with tears and smiles the badges of his grief and patience that had not god for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men they must perforce have melted and barbarism itself have pitied him but heaven hath a hand in these events to whose high will we bound our calm contents to bolingbroke we are sworn subjects now whose state and honour eye for eye allow here comes my son armorel o mel that was but that is lost for being richard's friend and madam you must call him rutland now i am in parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king enter o Merle. welcome my son who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring madam i know not nor i greatly care not god knows i had as lief be none as one well bear you well in this new spring of time lest you be cropped before you come to prime what news from oxford do these justs and triumphs hold for aught i know my lord they do you will be there i know if god prevent not i propose so what seal is that that hangs without thy bosom yea looks thou pale let me see the writing my lord tis nothing no matter then who see it i will be satisfied let me see the writing i do beseech your grace to pardon me it is a matter of small consequence which for some reasons i would not have seen which for some reason sir i mean to see i fear i fear what should you fear tis nothing but some bond that he's entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day bound to himself what doth he with a bond that he is bound to wife thou art a fool boy let me see the writing i do beseech you pardon me i may not show it i will be satisfied let me see it i say snatches it and reads treason foul treason villain traitor slave what is the matter my lord ho oh, who is within there enter a servant saddle my horse god for his mercy what treachery is here why what is it my lord give me my boots i say saddle my horse now by mine honour by my life by my troth i will impeach the villain exit servant what is the matter peace foolish woman i will not peace what is the matter armorel good mother be content it is no more than my poor life must answer thy life answer bring me my boots i will unto the king re-enter servant with boots strike him armorel poor boy thou art amazed to servant hence villain never more come in my sight exit servant give me my boots i say why york what wilt thou do wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own have we more sons or are we like to have is not my teeming date drunk up with time and wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name is he not like thee is he not thine own thou fond mad woman wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy a dozen of them here have ta'en the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at oxford he shall be none we'll keep him here then what is that to him away fond woman were he twenty times my son i would impeach him had thou groaned for him as i have done thou be more pitiful but i now know thy mind thou dost suspect that i have been disloyal to thy bed and that he is a bastard not thy son sweet york sweet husband be not of that mind he is as like thee as a man may be not like to me or any of my kin and yet i love him make way unruly woman exit after amorel mount thee upon his horse spur post and get before him to the king and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee i'll not be long behind though i be old i doubt not but to ride as fast as york and never will i rise up from the ground till bolingbroke have pardoned thee away be gone exeunt end of act five scene two act five scene three windsor a room in the castle enter bolingbroke as king henry percy and other lords
Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Tis full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang over us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there, for there, they say, he daily doth frequent, with unrestrained loose companions, even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes, and beat our watch and rob our passengers, which he, young, wanton, and effeminate boy, takes on the point of honour to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince, and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. And what, said the gallant? His answer was, he would unto the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favour, and with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute, as desperate, yet through both I see some sparks of better hope, which elder years may happily bring forth. But who comes here? Enter O'Murrell. Where is the king? What means our cousin, that he stares? and looks so wildly god save your grace i do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone withdraw yourselves and leave us here alone exeunt henry percy and lords what is the matter with our cousin now for ever may my knees grow to the earth my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault, if on the first how heinous ere it be to win thy after love I pardon thee. Then give me leave that I may turn the key that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. O Merle locks the door within. My liege, beware, look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence here. Villain, I'll make thee safe. Drawing. Stay thy revengeful sword, thou hast no cause to fear. Within. Open the door, secure, foolhardy king. Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door, or I will break it open. Bolingbroke unlocks the door, and afterwards relocks it. Enter York. What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger, that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Remember, as thou readst, thy promise passed. I do repent me, read not my name there. My heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, ere thy hand did set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. O oh, heinous, strong, and bold conspiracy! O oh, loyal father of a treacherous son! Thou sheer, immaculate, and silver fountain, from whence this stream, through muddy passages, hath held his current and defiled himself thy overflow of good converts to bad and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son so shall my virtue be his vices board and he shall spend mine honour with his shame as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold mine honour lives when his dishonour dies or my shamed life in his dishonour lies thou killst me in this life giving him breath the traitor lives, the true man's put to death. Within. What ho, my liege, for God's sake, let me in. What shrill-voiced supplicant makes this eager cry? Within. A woman, and thine aunt, great king, tis I. Speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. Our scene is altered from a serious thing and now change to the beggar and the king my dangerous cousin let your mother in i know she's come to pray for your foul sin if thou do pardon whosoever pray more sins for this forgiveness prosper may 
this festered joint cut off, the rest rest sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. Enter Duchess. O King, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love, loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Kneels. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. Not yet, I thee beseech. For ever I will walk upon my knees, And never see day that the happy sees, Till thou give joy, Till thou bid me joy By pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Kneels. Against them both my true joints bended be. Kneels. Ill mayst thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest? Look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears. His prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. Our knees still kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, Ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon should be the first word of thy speech. I never long to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king, let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth so meet. Speak it in French, king, say pardonne moi. Dost thou teach pardon, pardon to destroy, O oh, my sour husband? my hard-hearted lord, that settest the word itself against the word. Speak pardon as tis current in our land, the chopping French we do not understand. Thine eye begins to speak, set thy tongue there, or in thy piteous heart plant thou thine ear that hearing how our plaints and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee pardon to rehearse. Good aunt, stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him, as God shall pardon me. O oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee! Yet I am sick for fear. Speak it again. Twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. With all my heart I pardon him. O oh, God on earth thou art! But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford, or wherever these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them, if I once know where. Uncle, Farewell, and cousin, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed, and prove you true. Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 3 Act 5, Scene 4 Another room in the castle Enter Exton and a servant. Didst thou not mark the king? What words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me, as who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart, meaning the king at Pomfrey. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend, and will rid his foe. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 4 Act 5, Scene 5 
Pomfret, The Dungeon of the Castle. Enter King Richard. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it, yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world, in humours like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples, and do set the word itself against the word, as thus, Come, little ones, and then again, It is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls, and, for they cannot, die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves, nor shall not be the last, like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuge their shame, that many have, and others must sit there. And in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortune on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke, and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I nor any man that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Music Music do I hear? Ha <laughs> ha! Keep time! How sour sweet music is when time is broke and no proportion kept. So is it in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the concord of my state and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me, for now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watches on unto mine eyes, the outward watch whereto my finger, like a dial's point, is pointing still, in cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sounds that tell what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart which is the bell so sighs and tears and groans show minutes times and hours but my time runs posting on in bolingbroke's proud joy while i stand fooling here his jack o the clock this music mads me let it sound no more for though it have hope madmen to their wits, in me it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet blessing on his heart that gives it me, for tis a sign of love, and love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Enter a groom of the stable. Hail, royal prince! Thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. What art thou? And how comest thou hither, man, where no man never comes but that sad dog that brings me food to make misfortune live? I was a poor groom of thy stable, king, when thou wert king, who, travelling towards York, 
with much ado at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face oh how it yearned my heart when i beheld in london streets that coronation day when boardingbroke rode on roan barbary that horse that thou so often hast best rid that horse that i so carefully have dressed rode he on barbary tell me gentle friend how went he under him so proudly as if he disdained the ground so proud that bolingbroke was on his back that jade hath et bread from my royal hand this hand hath made him proud with clapping him would he not stumble would he not fall down since pride must have a fall and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back forgiveness horse why do i rail on thee since thou created to be awed by man was born to bear i was not made a horse and yet i bear a burden like an ass spur galled and tired by jauncing bolingbroke enter keeper with a dish keeper to the groom fellow give place here is no longer stay if thou love me tis time thou wert away my tongue dares not that my heart shall say exit my lord wilt please you to fall to taste of it first as thou art wont to do my lord i dare not sir pierce of exton who lately came from the king commands the contrary the devil take henry of lancaster and thee patience is stale and i am weary of it strikes the keeper help 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 enter exton and servants armed how now what means death in this rude assault villain thy own hand yields thy death's instrument snatching a weapon and killing one go thou and fill another room in hell he kills another then exton strikes him down that hand shall burn in never-quenching fire that staggers thus my person exton thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own land mount mount my soul thy seat is up on high whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die dies as full of valour as of royal blood both have i spilt oh would the deed were good for now the devil that told me i did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell this dead king to the living king i'll bear take hence the rest and give them burial here Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 5 Act 5, Scene 6 Windsor, an apartment in the castle Flourish. Enter Bolingbroke and York with lords and attendants. Kind Uncle York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Cicester in Gloucestershire. But whether they be tame or slain, we hear not. Enter Northumberland. Welcome, my lord. What is the news? First to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is, I have to London sent the heads of Salisbury, Spencer, blunt and cant the manner of their taking may appear at large discoursed in this paper here we thank thee gentle percy for thy pains and to thy worth will add right worthy gains enter fitzwater my lord 
I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brockus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, will I wot. Enter Henry Percy with the Bishop of Carlisle. The Grand Conspirator, Abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle living, to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his bride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverent room. More than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee have I seen. Enter Exton with attendants, bearing a coffin. Great King, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton, I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need. Nor do I thee, though I did wish him dead. I hate the murderer, love her murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor. But neither my good word nor princely favor with Cain go wander through shade of night, and never show thy head by day nor light. Lords, I protest my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for what I do lament, and put on sullen black incontinent. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land, to wash this blood off my guilty hand. Much sadly after, grace my mornings here, in weeping after this untimely beer. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 6. And End of Act 5. End of the Tragedy of King Richard II by William Shakespeare